my brothers and sisters in Islam, it is important for us to know that when we speak about the family unit or we speak about marriage, we have guidelines from the Lord of the worlds from the very beginning where the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him tells us how to choose a spouse. Now it was easy for me to start off from the birth of a human being because from the point of birth the upbringing that the parents afford that particular child will affect in a very great way the attitude of the child the faith of the child those are the two primary cornerstones that make up a healthy relationship if you want to know whether you will get along with someone or not you need to see two things and this is not only in marriage in anything you need to look at their relationship with their maker if they have a good relationship with their maker which is truthful and not hypocritical what that means is sometimes you have a person praying five times a day and I see this happening more and more. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, the salah or the prayer itself will prohibit people from or will prohibit from immorality and evil. But people are fulfilling salah and still they are immoral and they are evil. I don't know if you are seeing this. It's because there is something lacking in that prayer. Perhaps the sincerity, perhaps the genuineness. If you are really concerned about the Almighty, you will be able to protect yourself by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from anything that would disturb the relationship between you and your maker. And automatically it would result in you praying. It would result in you abstaining from the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I were a person who's constantly worried about the next prayer, where do I have the time to sin? Where? I don't. I read my Salatul Fajr and my mind is on Dhuhr. My mind is on the next prayer. I read the afternoon prayer, my mind is on the late afternoon prayer. I read the late afternoon prayer, my mind is on the prayer at sunset, al-maghrib, and there and, and so on. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Sometimes we pray, but we're not genuine. We just do it because our friends are doing it all, because we don't want to be seen as someone who's not praying. So learn to develop the sincerity when you're praying. Take your time, communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, take more time in sujood, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open your doors. My brothers and sisters, in any relationship, you check the link that that person has with the maker. And then you check their character and conduct. This is why when it comes to marriage, the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not say that you must marry the person who looks the best. You must marry the person who has the most money. You must marry the person who comes from the highest family in terms of lineage that is respectable. Or you must marry someone just because they are popular or powerful. No. He says clearly, إِذَا أَتَاكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ Subhanallah. If a proposal comes to you that is satisfactory, the person proposing is good in his deen and khuluq. That means relationship with Allah and relationship with the creatures of the same Allah. That's what it means. Allah, I have a relationship with Him. And those who Allah made, I have a relationship with them. When I look at others, I don't look at them as rich and poor and dark and fair and powerful and not powerful. I look at them as creatures of the same maker who made me. Their entitlement is just like mine. That's it. So when I look at them in that way and I respect them, it develops my own character and conduct. I finally understood where I fit in. I fit in just like another creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the deen is good, which means their link with Allah is good and the character is good, allow them to be married. Let it happen. That doesn't mean force your daughters, not at all. It means if a man proposes or a woman proposes and the other party is interested and they would like to get married, you as a person who is a guardian needs to look into these two things. 
If they are interested and these two things are in order, don't say no unnecessarily. This person comes from the south. No way, not my daughter. Who are you? Who are you? Allah who made you, gave you temporary, temporary guardianship of the child. Allah will take the child away. Many of us today, a friend of mine, Sheikh Imran, who we studied together with, told me he had a baby nine months. He went a few days ago in South Africa for the vaccination and three days later the child died. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them sabr and grant them a good reward for the patients. It's, it's tough. But when, we are, when the child is young, we don't realize this child actually belongs to Allah. We say, my son, my son, my daughter, my daughter, my this and my that. Subhanallah. Yes, yours. I agree. Subhanallah. But temporarily. As for Allah's, it is permanent. Belongs to Allah before it was given to you and will belong to Allah after it's taken away from you. Remember that. So your job as a parent is only to fulfill what Allah asked you to fulfill because he's going to question you about it. It's part of your test. That's it. He's going to question you. I gave you an amana, a trust for a short period of time. What did you do with that particular trust? We entrusted you with, oh, I just did what I wanted because I was the big boss of Abuja. Who are you? Allahu Akbar. Literally, that's the question. Imagine when we get on the day of judgment and we are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have no answer. What did you do? I refused. I allowed my child to commit adultery because I made marriage very difficult. Well, you share. You share a part of the sin. Remember that. You definitely do. You need to make it as easy as possible. Listen, my brothers and sisters. The more difficult we make halal, the easier we are making haram. The more difficult we make that which is permissible, the easier we are making that which is prohibited. Remember that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about these two characters through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyone you'd want to deal with, you need to develop these two things and understand you will get along with people who have the same two qualities. If I have got consciousness, I have a link with Allah and I'm worried about Allah and I'm worried about everything Allah made. Subhanallah, you get along with me very easily. For as long as you have a same concern and your links are also similar. May Allah make it easy for every one of us. Brothers and sisters, let us promise to develop our character, our conduct. We will build the marriage and the family. Develop your character and conduct. But primarily, to begin with, there is something I want to talk to you about. You know, when you're getting married, the imam, he comes forth and he recites a few verses. In the Arabic language, we call it khutbatul haja. Okay, what does it start with? Let me recite one or two verses or parts of it. The first verse. Ya ayyuhan nasu attaku rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum. O people, be conscious of your Rabb who made you. Be conscious of the one who made you, who created you, who nourishes, who provides for, who is in control of you. Be conscious of him. Taqwa. What is the meaning of taqwa? Before I get into it, I tell you the end of that verse. Allah says, Wattakullaha. Second time in the same verse. Wattakullaha alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham. Be conscious of Allah, whose name you use to ask for things from one another. You know, we say, Wallahi, Billahi, Tallahi. Don't we say that? We want people to believe us. We want people to do things for us, etc. We use the name of Allah. Nowadays, when a Muslim says, Wallahi, what happens? Especially when they say, Wallahi, there's a problem. There's something wrong there. They did not need to say that. Subhanallah. You could have said, Wallahi. It's not wrong to say, Wallahi. And sometimes, you know, it's part of the speech. Because Wallahi is part of the speech. You see what I just said? Which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about لا يؤاخذكم الله باللغو في أيمانكم ولكن يؤاخذكم بما عقدتم الأيمان Allah does not hold against you that which you say in terms of oaths by Allah as you are passing in speech. Someone says, what's the time? Wallahi, my brother, it's, it's about 11 o'clock. 
What you mean is, oh my brother, it's about 11 o'clock, but it's part of your speech. Some people have the statement that they keep uttering. It's not wrong. It's part of speech. It's not wrong to say that. For example, someone says, how are you? You say, Wallahi, my brother, I'm okay. Wallahi, my sister, you know, Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah. That doesn't mean I'm taking an oath. That's the name of Allah that's being used as part of my speech. Allah says, I won't punish you for that. I know that that both parties are aware of the fact that it's just part of a statement. But Allah says, when you promise, when you are taking an oath and you are making it confirmed, someone says, how old are you? You say 42, 43. Are you sure? Wallahi, I'm 42 or 43. Sorry, I'm not giving my age away. I'm just telling you. Okay. I could be, who knows? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing us of this. Allah is saying it twice in the, in the same verse. Be conscious of Allah. Number one, He says the one who made you. Number two, He says the one whose name you use. And then He adds to that, wal arhama. Be conscious of your relatives. Those who are connected to you from the wombs. So al arham is the plural of rahim, which means the womb. The womb. The womb. Subhanallah. Be conscious of those who are related to you through the womb. You know why? Because it was Allah alone who decided that they will be related to you. No one else. Think about it for a moment. Your relative, no matter who they are. How are they related to you? Was it your choice? Okay, take away the husband or the wife because you had a small role to play in it, right? But we're talking of those related to you through the womb. Was it your choice? No. No. You can desperately want to have been the brother or the sister of someone you can only be their brother and sister in humanity at times or if it's a bigger gift it's humanity as well as brother and sister in faith mashallah so taqwa taqwa allahi secondly another verse of khutbatul haja ya ayyuhalladhina amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatih وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ O you who believe, be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not allow yourself to die except in the condition of Islam or in the condition of submission to Allah. That means live your life every day as though you are going to die on that day. So you are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone might say, how can I... Ensure that I'm alive or oh, sorry that I pass away in the condition of Islam how, how can I be sure that I will be a submitter when I die the answer is Every day if you ensure that in yourself you realize I may not see the end of today So let me do something between me and Allah then there will come a day when that will definitely be your last day So that's another verse talking about taqwa Consciousness of Allah, etc. The third one also Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqu Allah wa qoolu qawlan sadeeda yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum Amazing. It's, this is only part of the verse. O oh, you who believe, be conscious of Allah. Taqwa for the fourth time in this khutbah that they are reading just before you get married. One of the places where it is read. That means the first and primary cornerstone and foundation of a happy home, a happy family, a happy marriage is taqwa Allahi. Now one might say, let's expand slightly on the term taqwa for the next two minutes. A lot of the people say, fear Allah. Have you heard that? Fear Allah. Fear Allah. It's commonly used. Some people would say, be conscious of Allah. I'm one of those. I would say, be conscious of Allah. It is a more positive term than fear Allah. Fear is more of khawf than taqwa. Khawf is more fear. Taqwa is actually from the creation of a barrier between you and something. And this is why the ulama have explained that the term taqwa is derived from the deeper meaning to create a barrier between you and the anger of Allah, the displeasure of Allah, the punishment of Allah, which means love Allah. When it comes to Allah, I will fulfill my salah, not because I'm scared of Allah, but I'm rather scared of the punishment of Allah. I'm scared to displease Allah. So I'm worried if I displease Him, I will be punished. More than that punishment is actually the displeasure of the one who made me. 
So there should be an element of love in taqwa. When you love someone, you don't want to displease them. Do you understand? When I love someone, I really don't want to displease them. People say, I love my mom, I love my dad, but they're not allowing me to marry who I want to marry. Well, maybe you have a problem, maybe they have a problem, or maybe both of you have a problem. Allahu Akbar. I can't just say, your dad is wrong, because I don't know the guy. If I knew him, I might also say no. And just to clarify that, if you want to say no, you need to have a valid reason. He needs to have been someone really out of tune completely. You know, no fulfillment of his duties unto Allah and no fulfillment of his duties unto the rest of humanity. Bad habits, etc. It brings me to the points, if you're listening carefully, these are points that are foundations of happy marriages. You don't have a bad habit. If you have a bad habit, kick it, including smoking. It's a bad habit. People do it socially. You know what is social smoking? <laughs> what was that for? I'm just puffing to show you at KFC we get onion rings. From my mouth you get smoke rings. Astaghfirullah. Smoke rings. Have you seen how they do it? And it comes out like this. And they try to impress. Quit the habit. Smoking kills. The whole world will tell you that. People say, is it halal, haram, makru, or haram? What is it? Wallahi, whatever it is, it's bad, terrible, quit it, cut it now. Because on the box it says, it kills or it is hazardous to the health. How can you as a Muslim still think that, you know what, it's fine for me to do this? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. I met a friend once. For your information, it was not in Nigeria, okay? So he had a cigar, big one, Cuban from Cuba. And he's just puffing. I said, what do you get out of it? He says, brother, it's the status. It's the status. The status. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. What kind of status is this? Like the people who go gambling and they're all sitting together and putting more and more. And they think, well, it's the status. When I go there, I'm given respect. But you're losing money. You're doing something haram. You're earning the displeasure of Allah. You're becoming mates with shaitan. And you're saying it's a status. Well, may Allah forgive us. That breaks the family. It breaks the marriage as well. Cut out these bad habits, no matter what they are. So taqwa is actually has within it an element of the love of Allah that is so deep that you don't want to displease Allah. Because you know, if I love Allah so much, I create a barrier between me and the displeasure of Allah. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani says, At-taqwa an taj'ala baynaka wa bayna adhab Allahi wiqaya. Taqwa is to create a barrier between you and the punishment of Allah. By doing what Allah wants and by staying away from His prohibition. Sometimes there is no barrier between you and the sin. But you just say, no, I won't do it. I don't want to displease the one who made me. I actually love him. I love him so much. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. So the first foundation of any relationship is taqwa. If you're conscious of Allah, automatically it will be a pleasure to interact with you because you don't have a closet where you hide all the skeletons and if you've done things wrong in the past you've sought the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we need to remember this so this is taqwa this is something important let's take a look at some of these verses because I've just read them now and I realized that one of these verses speaks also about the tongue O oh, you who believe, be conscious of Allah and only utter that which is upright. Qulu qawlan sadeed. Sadeed means straight, upright. Only utter that which is upright. Imagine if you're in your marriage and you only say things that are upright. It cuts out your swear words. It cuts out your lies. It cuts out all sorts of falsehood and insulting words, abusive words and hurtful words. Many men and women, we say things to our children, our parents, our spouses that are so hurtful and we think that we are entitled. We don't even consider it sinful. When you, your child is making a noise, shut up! And relax. Subhanallah. I went into one home and they said, hey, there was some noise going on in the background and someone started screaming. What were they saying? They tried to keep the children quiet. And then they said, Stop screaming! Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? 
It's silly. You are screaming to tell people to stop screaming. And that's what we do. We tell people to do, not to do things we are doing right now, right here. It doesn't help. So when you want someone to be in a certain way, you need to be in that way first. That's another foundation. To be a role model. I want my children not to commit adultery, but I'm everywhere every day and I'm praying for my daughters and my sons. May Allah forgive us. May Allah strengthen us. I want my children to pray, to dress appropriately, but I am only interested in everything, everything material. I'm not saying it's wrong to have handbags and accessories and so on and so forth, but when your whole life rotates around just that, and that's it, hook or crook. If you can afford something, Allah has blessed you with something, Alhamdulillah. You know, Allah allows you. There was once a man who walked in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he had tatty clothing. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, obviously inspired by Allah, revelation received by Allah subhanahu wa taala in so many different ways. He asks him, "What do you have?" The man says, "Well, I have a lot. I have a huge. Uh, I have a large flock of sheep and goats and so on, livestock." The Prophet ﷺ looked at his clothing, his clothing was tatty, and asked him to go back and dress up more appropriately. And he said, When Allah has blessed you, at least it, it should show in your appearance. Amazing. MashaAllah. When Allah has blessed you, it should show in your appearance. He did not say, that it should show negatively in your character. That's what happens to us. Once we are blessed, we have authority, we have power, we have money. We think that's it. The rest of the people are by the way. Wallahi, the driver who drives you might be closer to Allah than you ever were. Remember that. I don't know why I've given you the example of a driver. But it's, it could be the cook, the person working for you, the person whom you disrespect. The person who you think they are worth nothing, they are worth more in the eyes of Allah. We are not worth even the, the one wing of a fly in the eyes of Allah. It's called Janaha Ba'uba. We are not even worth that sometimes. And the people we think are weak and low, they are so valuable in the eyes of Allah. Subhanallah. So remember this, my brothers and sisters, if you want your children and if you want your family members to live a life that is good, you start living that life so that you can exemplify what you would like from them. Put it into an example. To lead by example is one of the most powerful ways taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the reasons why Allah chose him to go through challenges, difficulties, hardship, etc, etc. was not because he deserved it. Because he was the complete example. If someone wanted to emulate his life totally, they would definitely be from among those who endured because the most beloved, if the most beloved unto Allah endured so much, then the more Allah makes me endure, the more loved I am to Allah. The hadith says, when Allah loves you, He tests you. One might ask, how? If I love my child, I give them everything. With Allah, that is what he gives. He knows when I've given you a lot, I will test you so that you come close to me. Give you an example. A lot of us, mashallah, Allah has blessed us, right? We have so many blessings. These blessings that Allah has given us, sometimes they drift us away from the same Allah who gave them to us. Allah gave you money, you stopped coming to the masjid. Allah gave you authority, it started changing your attitude. Allah gave you some form of power, you started harming people. And you started attacking and pretending that you were a, a nice person, yet you were doing evil. So Allah says, hang on, we diagnose you with cancer. That's it. What happened? First time after many years, you got the result and you said, Ya Allah, what happened to that Allah? Now there was a big bell that rang, Kring! What happened? Ya Allah, you said that for the first time, genuinely, after 10 years of having everything. Allah says, I love you. That's why I just let you be positive, so that positive in your sickness, so that you can come to me. Now I heard you say my name. Come, I want to bring you further. You're going to get worse in health, but you will get stronger in spirituality. 
Now you start to cry. You go to the doctor. The doctor says, sorry, you just have four months to live. That's it. Ya Allah. From that day, tahajjud, you are up. Subhanallah. You are crying to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are saying, oh Allah, cure me. Ya Allah, I have no one besides you. Where was I all along? Subhanallah. Allah says, I love you, I brought you. Now do you realize when Allah loves you, He tests you because He knows that will bring you to Him. You come to Him, subhanAllah. And sometimes you say, oh Allah, take me out of this. Allah says, I want you. I want this relationship is so beautiful. Look at you. You are so close to me. I want to keep you in this condition for another four years. Imagine if you could hear Allah say that. What would happen? You would say, no, 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 no. And then I know of a person who when he was sick, he says, oh Allah, if you cure me, I will do this. I will never miss a salah. I will do this and I will do that. Be careful of big, big promises while you are ill and sick. Because once you become a person who's healthy again, yes, the farad you cannot compromise. But other things that you might have promised, who knows what will happen. I know of a person who started reading his salah because he was not well. And it was a serious illness. And a few years later, he became well. And we did not see him again in the masjid. Subhanallah. So guess what happened? A little time later, the same sickness came back. That was another gift of Allah. When I spoke to him as a counselor, as a Muslim, I told him, my brother, this was Allah taking you back to where you were in spirituality. But... Your health might have gone back. Your closeness to Allah is definitely much, much more. My brothers and sisters, we were talking about leading by example. We were talking about the gifts of Allah. When we have these gifts of Allah, sometimes we tend to distance ourselves from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bring yourselves closer to Allah. Learn how to speak to people. I was speaking about how you never know how close someone is to Allah, yet in terms of worldly hierarchy, they are far lower than you. But in the eyes of Allah, they are the ones. They are the ones, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Remember, um, any marriage or relationship within the family is based on respect. Respect. We know that. You need to respect one another. It's based on tolerance. It's based on the correct use of the tongue. I know I'm rattling them out one after the other, but I want to expand on something that you might not have expanded on before. And that is, it is based on giving people the independence that Allah has allowed them to have. Remember that. Many people will not talk about this. Today we have problems in homes. Do you know why? We want to control. That's why. Allah says, wait. Give them, let them fish. Give them the rod, let them fish. Within the limits of Allah, give them their freedom. I don't know exactly of this nation or the culture that happens in your societies, but I can tell you across the globe, we have a problem. What problem? Many of them. Connected to when you get married, people look at you as someone who has to fulfill a role that is semi-impossible to fulfill. So what was the point of getting married? And the other side of the coin is true also. We get married and sometimes we don't want any responsibility. We think it's a honeymoon. Like I said yesterday, we think it's a honeymoon. So, you know when you're on honeymoon, what's the difference between honeymoon and the, when the honeymoon is over? Can I tell you? When you're on a honeymoon, guess what happens? Your wife is honey, honey, everything honey. Hi honey, you're okay honey. And two weeks later, when she has to cook at home, subhanallah, honeymoon is over, isn't it? She becomes sugar, no more, no more honey. So now you call her sweetie. Hi sweetie. What happened to the honey? You don't know honeymoon is over. You're downgraded. You're now sweetie. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. And after that, hey my sugar, what's up? Sugar. Where sugar? Subhanallah. You're downgrading me without me realizing. I'm so excited about it. But that's what it is. Honeymoon is over. After that, he's, he calls you names. I remember one uh, you know, forward that we received on the phone once from one of my friends. And he says, there was a man who kept, he was an old man, 70 years old, 75 years old, and he kept referring to his wife with all these beautiful terms, sweetie and honey and lovey and dovey and everything else. And they said, yeah, you're so romantic. How come you have all these names, you know, that you call? He says, you know, to be honest, I forgot her name 40 years ago. <laughs> 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not let that happen to us. My brothers and sisters, remember marriage is one of the biggest sacrifices you will ever make. Remember that. Both male and female. If you are not prepared to sacrifice your entire system, your style will change. That's the sacrifice you have to make on both sides. If you're not prepared to sacrifice, perhaps it's not going to last. Perhaps there's going to be turbulence. There are going to be problems. A lot of the men think, you know, I don't need to adjust. She is the woman. She must come in and adjust. Who said that? The adjustment must happen on both sides. A little bit here and a little bit there. Give and take. That's what it is. Subhanallah. We need to sacrifice. You know, before you know it, the wife is expecting. And what happens? That is a sacrifice. You have to sacrifice your system, your, your sleep sometimes. You have to tolerate something grand sometimes. Not every pregnancy is the same. Every pregnancy is different, even with the same person. Every pregnancy is unique in one way or another. So what happens? You as a husband, you need to also share what is going on. Be sensitive to it. Say words of love. When Allah says, utter that which is upright, go out of your way to say the most beautiful things to your spouse, considering it an act of worship, both ways, husband to wife, wife to husband. The problem is some men, they know the most beautiful words. They will say, oh, you look stunning. You're gorgeous. You know, you're drop dead gorgeous. You're this, you're that. But they are saying them to the wrong people. That's a problem. You know all the words, but when you come home, hmm, there is the food ready. <laughs> no one would believe unless there was CCTV on you, what you just uttered to another sister who was not even supposed to be uttered those words. No one would believe what you did. How do you want your family unit to develop? How do you want your marriage to strengthen? How do you want your children to learn when you are being so hypocritical? Where it is deserved, you don't do it. And where it is not deserved, you do it. Many men could not be bothered to fulfill the conjugal rights of their own spouses because they do it in haram. Or sometimes they don't realize. The Prophet ﷺ says, فِي بُضُعِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَةً When you fulfill the intimate rights, of your spouse, it is a sadaqah, it is an act of worship, it is a charity. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu was surprised. They're listening, they said, me, have sex with my wife, and it's an act of worship. Whoa. So they said, how, oh messenger, how is that? You know what he said? Ara'ayta in wada'aha fi haram. Do you see if this person fulfilled his desires in a haram way, would he get a sin? They said, yes, he would. Well, if he fulfilled it in the right way, he would get a reward. Subhanallah. Many people say, you know, when a man calls his wife, she's supposed to respond. You know, subhanallah. What about the wife's needs? Many men don't even want to talk about that. You've left her alone. She's remaining this way as though she's a widow. Subhanallah. And she's not, she has a husband. He's not really interested. He's not keen. She'll touch you at night and so on. What do you do? Turn the other way. Hey, I'm tired. Trying to sleep. Don't you see? What time I came? What time do I go? And you say, what did I say? I didn't say anything. May Allah forgive us. The only reason I'm speaking bluntly and directly is because my beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has spoken in the same blunt and direct way. Otherwise, I would be ashamed of speaking and saying things. He spoke about it live, open, clear, no hiding. Because he, Allah knows this problem was there and it's going to come. Where men sometimes think, that's it, it's me. I'm only worried about me, me, me and me. You know, no way. Not at all. It is about us. It is about a family unit. A family unit is made up by more than one person. Otherwise, it's not called a family unit. A marriage is made up by more than one person. Otherwise, it's not called a marriage. You can't say I'm a married man when you don't have someone who called a wife. You can't say you're married. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength. So my brothers and sisters, it's important for us to know to give people their independence. When you're married, sometimes people think 
And I know the in-laws sometimes feel this in some cultures. Like I said, I'm not totally aware of the culture here, but I know in a lot of the places in the world, a woman gets married and the mother-in-law thinks that, okay, I can now fire the maid I used to pay because now I've got a maid whom I don't need to pay. If that's the case, you have failed. No woman would actually say no to doing some of the household chores if she is appreciated correctly. Am I right, sisters? You heard that. <laughs> they don't mind. They will cook for you. They will do for you and so on. They will say a lot. But at the same time, they will say as much. I'm sorry, they will do a lot. They want you to appreciate it. That's all. You just need to say, wow, you must have been working from the morning to the evening. Don't worry. The weekend, we'll, we'll go out to eat. I'm not encouraging going out to eat, by the way. But I'm giving an example. You can bring her something. Bring a little gift. We take gifts for everyone here and there. What about your spouse? What have you done? Have you ever brought her a gift or him? Have you ever decided sometimes, subhanallah? You know, I remember, and I'm going to tell you this, it's my own life, okay? So I'm not doing riba of someone or saying something of someone. One day, I was leaving to travel on a journey. And I remember, as I was going, there were some visitors. Now, normally you greet your spouse and you go as though you're never going to come back. Because every time you leave the home, it could be the last time. They may never see you again. So whenever you leave loved ones, make sure you utter beautiful words to them because it could be the last time that you're ever seeing them, right? So I saw my wife was busy and I'm thinking to myself, what should I do now? You know, she's there with the visitors. I can't go in. These are ladies sitting and saying, love you, man. love you, love you. And so, you know, some of us, it's still a little bit taboo to do it in public because... You know, I always believe when people show too much of love in public, I don't think they get along inside their doors, you know. It's just a show, you know. It's like the boxers who hold hands in public and they want to go, ah, they want to box each other, you know. They were just holding hands before the fight. But those who really love each other, it's more than words. It's more than, it's actually something you feel is there. That does not mean do not say the words. Nowadays, if you have not said, I love you, I adore you, I miss you, and so on, 20 times a day to your spouse, the new generation, they'll think you don't love them, no matter what. Did you hear what I said? Write it down, please. <laughs> Sending messages. We are professionals. We are on our phones all the time. You know, I read an article this morning saying, one man was saying, I used to wonder what Allah means when he says, you need to sit with total concentration in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or ponder over the verses of Allah with total concentration until I saw people sitting with the mobile phone. Now I know what it means. They talk to you, you can't hear them. Hello? Mm. How are you? Yeah. Everything is okay? Yeah. Are you stupid? Yeah. And so on. They don't even know what's happening around them. They, not concentrating, it's only on the phone. And we're sending messages, the heart. You know, I've spoken about it in the past. WhatsApp has done you a favor. It actually starts pumping. Before it wasn't even pumping. And we're sending those hearts every day. Kisses and hearts and blushing faces and love yous and everything else. Subhanallah. But to the wrong number. Wrong number. May Allah forgive us. Send it to the right number and your wife will be shocked. Your husband will be, are you sure? Are you sure it's the right person? <laughs> wow, amazing. This is how you build your home. You need to show this relationship. Work on it without working hard on a relationship. It's not going to just happen. No more. There is a lot of pressure out there from various angles to break your home. You need to work on it, work hard. Another thing is trust. Learn to trust one another, but it's not good enough to say, trust me, trust me. Do not give reason to your spouse to be mistrusted. That's also important. We always talk about trust. The men say, talk to the women, tell them they need to trust us. And I say, but men, I think those who know my style of answering, I normally, but listen guys, why do you give them reason to mistrust you? Why? So let's get back to my story. So I saw these people sitting there, right? And I decided, let me take a paper and write on a note. I love you. I miss you. 
I'm leaving, I'll call you later today, etc. Tore it and I put it under her pillow. And I went away. I was gone. There was no other way of doing things. You won't believe it. You won't believe it. She sends me a message later, talking of my own family. And she tells me, that was the best thing that have, has happened in a long time. For me, it didn't really. I just did it because of the circumstance. Note, subhanallah. I meant it. I, I'm not, it's not like I didn't mean it. But, what? subhanallah. But what I mean is something I probably re thought was this. I didn't realize the impact it would have in my own handwriting with a little squiggle at the back, looking like a signature, meaning at the bottom. And I just said two or three sentences and the impact it had. And when I went home, I saw the paper and now that was, you know, it was the center of a romantic relationship, you know. So I took the paper and I squashed it thinking I'll throw it in the bin and you know, hey, hey, leave it, leave it. I said like, what? It became an artifact of history, I promise you. I think it can be put up to shown to the generations, you know, dad, that's what he wrote for mom. Wow. Anyway, we ended up disposing of it because I said, no, if I leave it there, I might not write it again. If I don't, I'll end up writing it more and more and more. Subhanallah. You know, men always get their way somehow. I don't know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. But the reality, the reason I mentioned this is because what we take for granted, our spouses might never have thought it would come from us. We take it for granted. Work on your marriages. I promise you, you can. And there is another problem that we have. You marry a model, subhanallah. She cannot remain a model forever, subhanallah. She will not. She has to become a mother at some stage. You have to appreciate. You have to say, people say, ah, you are now too fat. And then in some countries, ah, you are too thin. I mean, what's going on? They say, not enough meat. And some people say, too much meat. Now, what's going on? Make up your minds, guys. What do you want? May Allah forgive us once again. The same applies to the women. I think women are more tolerant. But sometimes, yesterday there was a young man who complained. He wrote a question to me. And it was in the form of an instruction. Please tell the women not to be demanding. I said, well, you are telling me what to tell them. What's the point of bringing me here? They should have left me in Zimbabwe. They should have called you up and said, please tell them what you want to say. Subhanallah. Then I told him, I actually get up because I like to look at both sides of the coin. It takes two to tango. So I said, listen, if you want to get married, you need to be able to afford your spouse. I'm not saying that you need to be wealthy or something, but you, you cannot use me to put your, to rest your gun on my shoulder to shoot someone. No. And when they look at where the bullets coming from, they see me standing there. A lot of people do that. Do you hear what Mufti Meng said? Ah, so you're using me to shoot down someone else. A'udhu Billah. Stop it. That's not healthy for your relationship. Don't do that. You need to understand there are two sides of the coin. Just because you are miserly, you spend money on women, on wine, on children, and so on. Meaning on, on children that are not yours. The children of your girlfriend, A'udhu Billah. It's happening. And your own kids, they are dying, starving. They look at you even for a chocolate. Wallahi, I want to show you something. I'm showing it to you just for the sake of Allah. Look, my pocket is here. When I got out of the hotel, I took with me three small boxes of chocolate. Here they are. Two are here. Why did I do this? I said to myself, you know, I'll meet a lot of people. If I meet little children, I'll give them something. They'll probably remember me with this. And you know what? It might touch their lives forever. I got a chocolate. Here it is. Yesterday, I had a few sweets. I, held, I put them in my pocket to give people. Wallahi, every time I give someone something, I think to myself, when I go home, I'm going to make sure I take for my child as well. My own child. When I give someone something, and I've given gifts to many people, I always tell myself that, Ya Allah, help me to treat my family in an even better way. Because the hadith says about charities, that when you want to be charitable, start at home. It's an English saying as well, charity begins at 
home. It doesn't say charity begins at your girlfriend's home. No. It doesn't say that. Your home. Wallahi, there are people suffering in silence because they are ignored. So when you are selfish and you don't do things, you don't think things, you need to think and do and apply, etc. When you don't do that and you don't, and you don't think up ways of developing your relationship and then you want to come and as miserly as you are, use an excuse to say, you know what, don't be demanding. I didn't demand anything. It's expected of you. It's expected of you. This appreciation, someone cooks and you know the toast is burnt. The toast is burnt, for example. That's the only time you ever notice. But for the 10 years that the toast was fine, it was just come here. Why is there no butter here? Where's the jam? Where's this? Where's that? Where's the honey? Etc. And she looks at you and says, I'm here. I don't mean you, I mean the real honey. Aren't I the real honey? May Allah forgive us. My brothers and sisters, rather than that, when the toast is burnt, and I said this yesterday, I'm repeating it. You'd rather look and say, you know what, my darling, for years on end, mashallah, I had beautiful toast. Today, I'm trying something new. I only used to know about smoked salmon. Now I know about smoked toast as well. It's a way. Subhanallah. Everyone makes mistakes. You do too. But think about a way of expressing that while you appreciate the time and the effort put in, you will also overlook the mistake that happened. That's what it is. It happens to all of us. Time and effort, we put into something and sometimes the end result is not as we wanted it. Did they plan it? No, they didn't. So we don't. We become miserly. We don't want to spend in the right direction. Wallahi, there are men from amongst us who gamble. They throw their money where it's not even supposed to go. And their spouses are there. And guess what? They keep on telling them, hey, you're demanding. You're de but what am I doing? These are your children. This is your house. You are the one who asks for the food. I know of a wealthy man. Wallahi, again, not in Nigeria. You know, I have to clear my, my, myself. I know a wealthy man, he asks his wife, he's wealthy. When I say wealthy, he is a millionaire. He asks his wife for receipts of the groceries that she buys every day. Wallahi al-Azim. May Allah forgive us. He asked his wife for receipts. I want to know what happened. The, 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 the issue came to me. Hey, this man is wealthy and look at what he does. You filled petrol, where's the receipt? I want to see. Come on. That's your spouse. Take your money and shove it into your mouth, man. Eat it. Go. Digest it. Do what you want. Get out. Some people get fed up. They are angry. What's all this money all about? Why? Spend it. And the best place you can spend it is, the hadith says, to put a morsel of food in the mouth of your spouse and children is an act of worship. Did you know that? Even literally. To take it in your hand and put it in the mouth of your spouse is a sadaqah. It is an act of charity. It is an act of worship. Today, go home, my beloved men who are here, and go to your spouse. Not your girlfriend. <laughs> spouse, remember what I'm saying. Take the food in your hand and put it into the mouth. Not a fork. You might just poke her. Take it in your hand and lovingly Put it in. See what it does to your relationship. See what it does to your relationship. Instantly, there will be a change. Instant. Some of us are so, so horrible at home, your wife might think you're shoving poison into my mouth. What's going on here? You know? Change that. Go out of your way to say things that help people, make them feel worthwhile. Our children, one is dark in complexion, one is fair. We only talk to the one who's fair. Wallahi, I have emails sent to me by children. I cry, Wallahi al-Azim, when I hear the child saying, because I'm dark in complexion, I'm not allowed to go shopping with my mom. Qasaman. I couldn't believe it. That's your child. No matter what, even if they are challenged or disabled, you must be proud of your child. I love you, my child. You are my love. I love you. Allah gave you to me as a door to enter Jannah. That's what it is. 
Never discriminate. Some of us have no time for children. I decided recently, you know, my phone, mashallah, I receive messages every few seconds. Every few seconds. And I have two or three different categories of messages. It's categorized. I can pick up some very quickly and some, they, they are just numbers because I don't save a number unless I actually have a relationship with you. And I know who you are personally. Subhanallah, all there is a matter I'm dealing with. So you get a lot of messages. You don't even know who they are. And that's one of the worst things. When someone messages you a question, introduce yourself. Come on. You don't want to introduce yourself. Don't expect a response. For all I care, you could be anyone and, and, and someone with evil intention as well. And I don't need to. It's not my duty to respond to the whole world. You can seek from many other ulama. I know I have 100 emails. I'll reply a day and that's it. More than that, I can't. And that's a figure that's been pushed up from 10 to 20 to 50 to 100. It's a lot. It takes up a lot of time. But recently I decided when I am going to eat. Now why I'm saying this, it's to develop the family and the marriage. When I am going to eat, my phone will stay in the room. Or in the lounge. I do not take it with me on the table, no matter what. That's recently I decided. Why? I realized that as a busy person as I am, I sit on the table to eat. And you know what happens? By default, I'm just checking my phone, responding. Sometimes my kids are talking to me and I didn't pick it up. And I am busy preaching to the rest of the world to say, watch out. And I said, no ways. I need to practice what I preach. Put this away. Put it away. And now I've put it away. And wallahi, it is the best time you can have as a father with your children and your family. As a mother, Allah offers you something grand and great. Everyone sit down together to eat. It will happen at least once a day with everyone. And if it's a bonus, more than once. In our countries, we can do it more than once. In the first world, wow, I, it's once a week or twice a week, they get an opportunity to do it because morning to evening, people are out. But you have to do this. You must put your phone aside, talk to them. Table manners, everything else. How was your day? What happened through your day? You know, there are public examinations. Your child comes up with results. They don't need to have been rocket scientists. Even if they haven't done as well as you thought they would do, tell them, well done. I'm so proud of you because you are the only person whom they will hear that from. Did you hear that? I'm proud of you. They don't need to be first in class because first in class is just one person. Maybe two if there is a tie. So that means the parents of the rest of them must be upset? No. Even if your child has failed, how many of us sitting here have failed once or twice in certain things we do in life, when we repeat it, we pass again, second time. Nobody made a big deal out of it. But we as parents today, in today's society, there are predators who are waiting to actually wolf on our children as they grow older, to lure them into their traps of drugs and sex and illegitimacy, whatever else it is. By showing them a little bit of attention. Why? There is an attention deficit back at home. That's the reason. You want to develop your home? Give your undivided attention to your family members. Put your phone aside. I promise you, make a rule. Dad, you start. Mom, don't think I'm not going to come to you. You are equally guilty. May Allah forgive us. Imagine the child is crying for you. The child is crying for you and you're busy on your phone showing people, you know, the selfies. <laughs> What's going on? Life, that's life has become like, and your child is screaming. If only those people who saw the selfie could hear the sound at the same time, they would wonder where you were. You sound like you're in a war zone, the way your children, you don't, you're not worried about anything. My brothers and sisters, learn to appreciate one another. I said, appreciating your wife once she becomes a mother, understanding that those are your children, she bore them for you. So naturally her body will change. That doesn't mean, my beloved mothers, that you can just let yourself go and just blame it on motherhood. No. Take pride in yourselves, in your health. There is a lot of pressure on the men out there. Take pride in yourself, your health. Make sure that you exercise. When I say exercise, I mean you burn whatever you may have in terms of excess by 
whether it's on the treadmill or any other healthy way of doing things, make sure you make an effort in that regard as well. So when I say the men should appreciate their women, I'm not saying that the women should now just forget about it and say, you see, you're supposed to appreciate me and I'm not appreciated. But you're wasting yourself. Don't waste yourself. Some people are naturally big, mashallah. Some people are naturally small, mashallah. You need to understand this. But at the same time, don't allow yourself to become unhealthy. That's the word. Unhealthy. It's got to do with healthy and unhealthy. Subhanallah. But guess what? The last time I spoke about this, some of the women reprimanded me. They said, why don't you tell the men? Some of them waste themselves. Look the stomach. It sticks as there. When I was pregnant nine months, my husband looked like he was 18 months. <laughs> Subhanallah. It needs you to do a few sit-ups, a few push-ups and so on and so forth. Mashallah. I hope you're not looking at my belly. Let me stand this way here. <laughs> no, mashallah. We take, we take interest in what we look like. We have to because we have spouses. The difficulty is a lot of men are guilty of taking pride in what they look like for other reasons. Other reasons. So it's either because of your work or it's because of someone you want to impress whom you're not even supposed to be impressing. For what? What's the purpose? Every time I look at my hair, you know, I'm bald. So I look at my head and my mother looks at me. And you know what she tells me? You're already married. What's the point of taking so much pride in all of this? What are you worried about your head for? And I look at her and I said, Mom, there's still some spaces, you know. <laughs> she says, you men, you're all the same. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. That was just a joke, by the way. That was just a joke, by the way. So we need to realize, my, my brothers and sisters, one of the greatest foundations, and I know my time is almost up, 56 minutes uh, already, but it's healthy, inshallah. Five more minutes, alhamdulillah, that's good. I want to end off by saying a few things. Brothers and sisters, one of the most important issues is communication. You need to speak to each other. You need to relate to each other. And in order to encourage communication, you need to know how to react to something you've been told by a spouse, a family member, a child, etc. You need to know. You say communication, your child comes to you and says, you know, I made a mistake. I actually did something terrible. And they tell you something terrible, terrible. Can I say one of the worst things that happens? A daughter comes to you, may Allah protect all our children. I mean, say I mean loudly, may Allah protect our children. And a child comes to you 14, 15 years old and says, Mom, I don't know who to turn to. I'm pregnant. They don't come to you because you don't encourage promotion of communication. If they say, I broke the glass, Qiyama already starts. Because your own trumpet was blown rather than Israfil blowing the trumpet. So for them, Qiyama came, the glass broke, and ah, that's the trumpet, they got to run. It's the end of the world. Glass broke, take it easy. Don't worry, did you get hurt? No, I didn't. Well then, the glass will buy another one tomorrow, it's fine. No, I remember one case where the child was beaten up because one glass broke. You know why? It was one of a set of six. And now they, they didn't, they were too embarrassed to put five glasses looking one way, and the sixth one must look different. What's the big deal? Put the sixth one and if I were you, I would tell the guests, I'm so proud of having one different one because my child broke one and I happily told him, don't worry, I will use the five and I will show them that you, at least you were not hurt. Why? What's wrong? What's the big deal? You can, you can start a trend. People will learn things. So when people, when the children communicate or the spouse communicates, you need to react correctly to encourage them to... Understand that you are the closest person to them. When they have a problem, they must come to you firstly, no one else. And when will they come to you firstly? When you've reacted correctly to them. Do you tell your daughters, your sons, even those who are older, I love you, etc. I have children who are old, mashallah. I have six daughters by the will of Allah and two sons. And my daughters are old in their 20s. And I write to them, I love you. I miss you. 
And I send them little kisses and faces. I'm sure if you saw that, you might think, hey, is this a father or is he a boyfriend? There is a distinct relationship. And I know that I make sure that these words come out of my mouth for them. They must know it. And I love you. And if there's anything, talk to me. And they have, mashallah. They have. And imagine if a child comes to you going back to what we just said and tells you, I'm pregnant. What do you do? You know what? Okay, I was going to say something about my son, but let's, let's leave that, okay? He might not, it was the way he damaged a vehicle and what happened, one of those things. But I reacted in a beautiful way. I won't talk about it because he won't like it, okay? But imagine when, when someone does something, you say, look, you know what, you've made a mistake. I'm definitely hurt and I'm saddened, but I love you so much. I'm going to help you through this. That's how you talk. That's how you build a relationship. Because someone else will tell them, don't worry, I'll help you do this, I'll help you do that. They become closer to a devil outside the home because you didn't know how to react. So this is something important. Communication. Communication is absolutely important. These are topics on their own. Maybe the next peace and unity convention we have, we will break down each one of these things and we'll expand on them. Because wallahi, it's important. I spoke earlier about independence. You know what that means? When your children are married, let them do their thing. Let them to a great degree make decisions as well. I know homes where father makes a decision for children even who they will marry. And secondly, he makes decisions for the grandchildren as well. Why? That's how it works. It doesn't work like that in Islam, let alone in anything else. So the modern world blames us for being people who are hardline, extreme, and so on, oppressive. But it's not Islam. It's the way we've been doing things. No, you don't make decisions for your whole family all the time. Give them the freedom of making their decisions at times. You need to know. And this is why when it comes to marriage, one of the most important things is for us to understand that the choice belongs to them who are getting married. We will guide them. If they're making a ridiculous mistake, we will, we will tell them, we will be firm with them. But if it's something Allah has allowed, who am I to disallow it? If it is something Allah has allowed, who am I to disallow it? I will not have an answer on the day of judgment when Allah asks me, why did you block something that I unblocked? Are you competing with me? Go back to the teachings of Allah and His Rasul and check what you are supposed to be doing and do it. My beloved brothers and sisters, responsibility is key as well. Many of us are irresponsible. Very irresponsible in so many different ways. It's a word, but it comes with a lot of difficulty. It's not easy to be responsible. You need to control yourself. You need to lower your gaze. When the hadith speaks about lowering your gaze, yes, it is something grand and great. I remember a man, the wife comes and she says, you know, my husband, he cannot control his eyes. Every time he sees a woman, he has to turn around to look at her behind. And I'm like, what's going on? And I kept on reading and guess what it says? And a lot of those behinds are fake. It took me a while to understand what she said there. And then she went on to say, Sheikh, I don't know if you're aware that you can actually purchase a behind and wear it. <laughs> what? And the poor man is admiring some silicone that's there. May Allah forgive us. A'udhu Billah. In both ways, he's wrong. Lower your gaze. You develop your relationship for the sake of Allah. Lower your gaze for the sake of Allah and look at how your family will blossom. Your relationship with your spouse will blossom and bloom. You cannot have all the roses in the garden. You took your pick and that's it, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. I wish, and I, I wish that I had more time, but inshallah there will always be another time if Allah wills and if not me, someone else. I hope that the few words I've said have motivated myself, inshallah, made me more conscious of my own relationships with my family members and made me more conscious of my own marriage. And at the same time, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to also change in one way or another. Remember what I said about the morsel, inshallah, 
today. Do you remember what I said about the Mosul, my brothers? That was weak. Do you remember what I said about the Mosul, my brothers? Yes. Subhanallah. I don't know why those who are not married were saying yes. But it's okay, inshallah. May Allah make it easy for you on that day. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the best of spouses. May He make us choose the right spouse, the, those with deen and khuluq. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us entry into Jannah with ease. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.